pleased to see you all here today for the session Jesus Wept, Misericordia in Augustine, Aquinas, and Malik. I'm delighted to introduce Professor John O'Callaghan from here at the University of Notre Dame. John O'Callaghan is an associate professor of philosophy and the director of the Jacques Maritain Center at the University of Notre Dame. A member of the faculty since 2003, O'Callaghan graduated from St. Norbert College in 1984 and earned a master's degree in mathematics from Notre Dame in 1986. He worked as an engineer in Boston for two years before returning to Notre Dame, where he earned a doctoral degree in philosophy in 1996. Before joining the Notre Dame faculty, O'Callaghan taught philosophy at Creighton University and the University of Portland. In 2006, he was appointed director of the Jacques Maritain Center, succeeding Notre Dame philosopher Ralph McInerney. In 2010, he was appointed a permanent member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, established in 1879 by Pope Leo XIII, to promote the study of the thought of St. Thomas and to bring it into engagement with contemporary culture. He served as the president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association in 2012 to 2013. He's also currently working on a book on Misericordia, provisionally entitled Mercy Beyond Justice. And the paper title again today is Jesus Wept, Misericordia in Augustine, Aquinas, and Malik. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was watching a um, YouTube clip last night of Jimi Hendrix playing um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band um, two days after it came out in London with the Beatles in the audience and he comes out on stage and he, sa and he puts his fingers in his ears and he says, watch your ears, watch your ears. The volume on this might be kind of loud if you've ever seen the film. Um, there's much more than just the film here, but if you've seen the film Tree of Life, the very first thing it says is the producers of this film suggest that it be played with the volume very loud because the um, dialogue is very soft. Uh, and also to enrich the musical aspects of it. So um, I hope no one's ears are hurt. And if they are, we'll turn it down. If it's too low, we'll turn it up. So the line separating good and evil passes not through states, not, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. What I would like to do here is to try to think about God's response to evil, particularly the evil that all human beings suffer from, the evil of death. In this life, we may never understand why evil is allowed to exist. Indeed, even as a philosopher, I don't believe it is given to, given to us to understand that. On the other hand, God's response to the evil of suffering and death is manifest in life in misericordia, a suffering heart that shows itself in the world and acts to assist those who suffer. If you have the patience, I hope by the end, I will, with your help, say, have said something in my little way that is worthwhile about the small bridgehead in our hearts that is misericordia. Contrary to popular belief, the motto of the University of Notre Dame is not God, country, Notre Dame. <laughs> it is vita dulcedo et spes. That Latin phrase is from the Salve Regina. Salve Regina, mater misericordiae. Vita dulcedo et spes nostre salve. Hail queen, mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, our hope. Hail. In that opening line of the prayer, we are given the image of Mary mothering mercy to us. Although, as the prayer continues, she has misericordes, or sorry, misericordes oculos, eyes of mercy, she is not mercy itself. What she bears to us in her womb gives birth to and mothers is misericordia incarnate. Mary mothers mercy. It is Jesus whom she mothers to us. Her eyes of mercy turn towards us. She offers us her misericordia by offering us misericordia itself in the flesh. She offers us her son. The hymn goes on to speak of the valley of tears. Ad te suspiramos gementes et flentes in hoc lacrimarum vale. To you do we sigh, groaning 
and weeping in this valley of tears. Lacrimaru, tears. Mater misericordia, accordia in hoc lacrimarum vale. Misericordia literally means a suffering heart. So when the hymn says mater misericordia, its first literal meaning is mother of a suffering heart. The heart is the seat of love. What Mary gives birth to is love itself in the flesh that weeps and suffers with and for us. Scripture tells us that Jesus wept at least twice. He wept over Jerusalem, and he wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus. He did not weep in the garden before his own death, though he sweat blood. Um, and even though he prayed that the cup might pass him by, he did not weep for himself. He did not weep for himself on the cross, even though he quoted the Psalms on divine abandonment. So why in particular did he weep at the grave of Lazarus? He's like Mary and Martha. They've lost their brother. He has lost a friend. As a human like us, we can understand his tears, although philosophers of a classical Stoic bent, like Cicero and Seneca, would accuse him of weakness and compare his tears to those of, quote, wretched and old women, unquote, expressing a, quote, vice of the soul. Seneca once wrote to a friend whose son had died and told him and asked for his, um, you know, uh, consolation. He wrote to him, you want tears? I send you abuse. Christ is also God and knows that he will raise Lazarus from the dead. Why doesn't his divine nature, with its omnipotence and omniscience, wash out the reality of his human nature precisely here, when he knows that he'll fix it all for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, like a deus ex machina in a morality play, coming in at just the right moment to make everything come out all right in the end? Perhaps the fact that Jesus first weeps suggests that the incarnation is not, after all, a deus ex machina a too neat solution to the reality of suffering and death. Augustine also wept. In the Confessions, he discusses two very important moments in his life when he wept. Through memory, he goes back to the time in his youth when one of his closest friends fell ill. After a brief recovery, the friend relapsed and died suddenly. Augustine wonders why he wept so terribly over the death of his friend. He writes, Grief darkened my soul, Everything on which I set my gaze was death. All that I had shared with him was without him transformed into a cruel torment. I had become to myself a vast problem. Only tears were sweet to me and in my soul's delight. Consider that last sentence in which Augustine expresses a kind of delight in his weeping. He asks God, can I hear from you who are the truth and move the ear of my heart close to your mouth? so that you can explain to me why weeping is a relief to us when we are unhappy. As a mature Christian writing the Confessions, Augustine takes a very negative view of the way he had wept for his friend. He ultimately con concludes that in his youthful weeping at the death of his friend, he was really weeping for himself. Quote, I was so wretched that I felt a greater attachment to my life of misery than to my dead friend. I was more unwilling to lose my misery than him, and I do not know that I would have given up my life for him. I found myself heavily weighed down by a sense of being tired of living and scared of dying. The lost life of those who die becomes the death of those still living. What is striking about Augustine's description of the way he mourned for the death of his friend as a youth is the way its structure is reminiscent of Aristotle's treatment of catharsis in the Poetics. On a common interpretation of Aristotle, he explains that in watching a tragedy, we observe the unjust suffering of someone very much like ourselves. This causes us to experience the pain of aleas, often translated as pity. From the pain, we then move to fear for ourselves, phobos, that a similar fate awaits us. Then in the climax of the drama and its resolution, we experience a kind of catharsis, literally a vomiting up of those unruly passions of Eleos and Phobos, accompanied by the pleasure that follows the relief from the tension we have expelled with our vomiting. It's important to distinguish this Greek Eleos and Phobos 
pity and fear from the compassion that Aquinas will later analyze as the starting point of misericordia or mercy. Compassion is driven by friendship with and for one who suffers, even someone who is suffering justly. Driven by friendship, one suffers with the one who suffers. That compassion, that suffering with, causes one to draw nearer to the one suffering in order to assist him or her. Pope Francis echoes this theme in Aquinas perfectly when he says, there is no mercy from a distance. Eleos, or pity, on the other hand, is a pain upon the occasion of, uh, upon the occasion of observing the pain of another, but not suffering with the pain of another. The one suffering Eleos moves away from the other out of fear for oneself, putting distance between oneself and the suffering. The paradigmatic story expressing the difference between compassion and Eleos is the story of the Good Samaritan, who is explicitly described as a man of misericordia. Moved by compassion for the stranger who is only described as an anthropos, a human being, the Samaritan descends from, on top, from atop his horse and moves toward the human being to assist him. By contrast, the priest and the Levite move away from him, driven by their fear, to take the long way around. Augustine's youthful tears for his friend and the relief and delight he felt in shedding them were more like classical pity, fear, and catharsis than compassion and misericordia. In a theological leitmotif, Augustine later discusses the tears he wept at the death of his mother. He describes a kind of stoic reserve he maintained at her funeral, resisting the kind of weeping and wailing he says were all too dramatic and expected at funerals. But then later, in private and before God alone, he gives way to his weeping. Now I let flow the tears which I had held back so that they ran as freely as they wished. My heart rested upon them. And it reclined upon them because it was your ears that were there, not those of some human critic. Let alone, let anyone who wishes read and interpret as he pleases. If he finds fault that I wept for my mother for a fraction of an hour, the mother who had died before my eyes, who had wept for me that I might live before your eyes, let him not mock me, but rather, if a person of much charity, let him weep himself before, before you for my sins. Notice the way that Augustine describes his mother's weeping for his conversion and his plea that others will weep for him in his sins or for his sins. Her weeping for him is not out of pity and fear. It's a compassion that prompts her to act on behalf of the one who suffers, her son Augustine, who is spiritually dead before God. But then Augustine turns to explain his weeping for his mother. On behalf of your maidservant, I pour out to you, our God, another kind of tears. They flow from a spirit struck hard by considering the perils threatening every soul that dies in Adam. Therefore, God of my heart, my praise and my life, I set aside for a moment her good actions for which I rejoice and give you thanks. I now petition for my mother's sins. I know that she acted mercifully and from her heart forgave the debts of her debtors. Now please forgive her her debts if she contracted any after the many years that passed after she received the water of salvation. Forgive, Lord, forgive, I beseech you. Let mercy triumph over justice, for your words are true and you have promised mercy to the merciful. That the merciful should be so was your gift to them. That the merciful should be so was your gift to them. I'm sorry for the length of that passage, but it's really difficult to know how to stop. Augustine writes so movingly of the death of his mother and mercy. If you can, uh, if you can, if you can read just that section of the Confessions, that's the one to read. Augustine no longer speaks of fear for himself. He no longer expresses an attachment to his sorrow. He no longer speaks of enjoying or delighting in his grief as a kind of catharsis. Instead, he rests in his tears because it is God who hears them. He is weeping in compassion and sorrow at the suffering of another, his mother and all those born in Adam who must suffer death. These are, as he says, another kind of tears. When Augustine discusses the, or sorry, when Aquinas discusses the virtue of misericordia, he quotes scripture. 
We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. Misericordia is grounded in friendship, in the union of friendship. Misericordia makes the suffering of one's beloved one's own and then acts to alleviate it to the extent possible. This aspect of Aquinas' analysis of mercy reflects, but is also an inversion of what Aristotle said about the highest form of friendship, the friendship of good character in pursuit of a common good. Aristotle had said that in this highest friendship, one makes the good of another one's own. By making the good of, a, of one's friends one's own, one acts to pursue that good now as one's own end or good. However, Aristotle had also said that the fact that one mourns with one's friends was a reason to have very few friends. <laughs> Suffering and mourning pose a problem for friendship. They are to be avoided, and thus those who suffer are to be avoided as friends. Aquinas, by contrast, argues that to make the good of another one's own requires that one make their suffering one's own as well. You cannot be a friend of another if you will not suffer with him or her. He also differs from Aristotle by arguing that there's no choice in friendship. We are all bound together as friends in our common humanity, with union with God as our common good, towards which we are born as made to his image and likeness. Again, the Good Samaritan is the measure of human friendship. The suffering man on the road is described in no other terms than an anthropos, a human being. You do not get to choose whom your friends are. That was chosen for you when you were born into the human community. You were given friendship to all human beings when you were given life. It's true that that friendship for all human beings takes on different forms according to relations of proximity, Aquinas says. But all you get to choose in this life is whether you will live up to that friendship that was given to you from the beginning. Hopefully. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry. There we go. When did you first touch my heart? If you can, uh, as we near the end or throughout, try to remember the position of her hands there. Augustine is Monica's son, but as a Christian, he is also her friend in God. So recall the beautiful scene at the window in Ostia in the Confessions, just before she dies, where they speak of their Christian faith and friendship in God. Suffering in genuine compassion with Monica, Augustine then acts on her behalf to relieve her misery in the death of Adam to the extent that he can. He prays for her that God will be merciful toward her, that he says, mercy will triumph over justice. That notion of mercy triumphing over justice is echoed later by Aquinas. When discussing God's justice and mercy, he argues that mercy, 
goes beyond justice. Indeed, that justice, quote, strives after mercy. Aquinas argues that God's every act expresses both his justice and his mercy. Thus, justice does not also achieve, or sorry, thus justice that does not also achieve mercy fails as justice. Even the act of creation expresses divine mercy, the act whereby in the beginning all things are brought out of nothing, drawn into union with God, is an act of divine mercy. The Augustinian character of Terence Malick's The Tree of Life is manifest in a number of ways. References to Augustine's confessions abound in the various plot elements of the film, as the older Jack reminisces upon his childhood and youth. He remembers the beginnings of sexual awakening, his envy of others, his alienation from his father, who was a stern, driven, but fundamentally good father like Patricius was for Augustine. He, he, uh, he, remembers his increase, uh, yes. he remembers his increasingly awkward relationship to his loving mother as he grows into adolescence. The giveaway that we are to think of the confessions while watching the film is in the broken windows scene. Young Jack is running around making mischief with his band of friends. We see them smashing an aluminum trash can, blowing up a bird's nest with firecrackers, Later, setting off a frog on a rocket. I never did that, but I did do things like that. <laughs> but most striking of all is when Jack is encouraged by a friend to throw a rock through a window just to violate the rules that have been given to him by adults. After he breaks the window, he grins widely and turns for approval to his friends who look on in admiration. <laughs> his little brother uh, walks away and doesn't participate. <coughs> this is the pear scene in the Confessions, where Augustine and his friends steal some pears, not because they are hungry, but because they wanted to do something bad, for the hell of it, as we might say. Augustine says that it wasn't simply the desire to violate the rule given to him by authorities, but that even with that desire to rebel against authority, he would, have not, he would not have stolen the pears but the, for the presence and approval of his friends. Deeper than the explicit plot elements that remind us of the confessions is the aesthetic construction of the film itself. In general, there is the use of narration over the scenes being depicted. Sometimes the narrator appears to be addressing other characters in the film, characters that are being recalled from memory of childhood, as when Jack says, Mother, Father, always you are within me. Other times the narrator appears to be addressing God directly, as when he says, Brother, Mother, it was they who led me to your door. And how did you come to me? In what shape? What disguise? After he is reconciled with his little brother R.L., Jack says in over-narration, I didn't know how to name you then, but I see it was you, always you were calling me. Anyone who has read the Confessions cannot help but hear the voice of Augustine addressing God in these bits of over-narration in the film. Even more subtle is the use of memory or anamnesis to structure the film. Memory or anamnesis is a theme that Augustine takes from Platonic philosophy, the thought that understanding comes from a re recollection of life in the presence of the abstract eternal forms in a mythological but temporal past. However, Augustine puts this principle of anamnesis to theological purposes in both the Confessions and his great work, De Trinitate, or On the Trinity. In the Confessions, the memory is a temporal memory of events in Augustine's life in pursuit of self-understanding, of how God has brought him to the life of grace. What Augustine pleads for in the Confessions is that he come to see and understand the narrative of his life as God sees it, 
from eternity. His mundane experience of his life is fragmentary as it is experienced in and through time. But if he can come to see it as God sees it, he will see that it is a kind of narrative, a story being told by God through him. The key is to see and understand oneself as God sees and understands oneself, and then to love oneself as God loves oneself, rather than as one loves oneself apart from God. From such divine love, one can then see and understand others as God sees and understands them and love them as God loves them. This is what it is to be made to the image and likeness of God as Genesis describes our creation in the beginning. So the temporal memory of one's life informed by God's eternal vision leads through the love of God to self-understanding and the love of oneself and neighbor in God. This is for Augustine the life of Caritas. Sin, on the other hand, is forgetfulness of God, to whom we are always actually present, even when he is not present to us in our memory, understanding, and love. In that forgetfulness of God, we forget ourselves. The Greek word for forgetfulness is lethe. Now consider the various ways in which Malik's film uses forgetfulness and memory. The most obvious way is in the narrative itself, Jack, apparently upon the anniversary of his brother R.L.'s death, begins a process of memory about his childhood, a memory that begins with the lighting of a votive candle for his brother. In the over-narration that follows, he speaks of loss and forgetfulness, but also of the desire to remember and find what he has lost. It is through the memory of his childhood, and in particular the suffering of his mother and father, that he returns to the life of grace in the end of the film. But Malik's use of memory is deeper and more rich than this relatively surface narrative plane. Synesthesia is a condition in which some people suffer a, trans a transfer of sense modalities. Seeing, for example, sounds, or hearing colors. In viewing the film for the first time, I had the sense that I was viewing a piece of music. The sen that sense, uh, sorry, the sense was that the visual experience was itself musical. I think that was a deliberate effect of Malik's use of the musical technique of light motif, but now in the medium of light and shadow rather than sound and silence. In light motif, a musical theme is repeated at crucial points in a score to recall something earlier. When the earlier moment in the score is remembered through the later moment, the earlier event is re-understood as foreshadowing the later instance. And yet the um, earlier occurrence isn't usually just, sorry, and yet the later occurrence isn't usually just a simple repetition, but involves a variation on the original theme. Then still operating in memory, the earlier occurrence is also better understood in light of the later. In our hearing and understanding of the musical piece, there's a kind of circling around of the musical occurrences, held by memory before the mind as a single instant. So for example, Augustine engages in a kind of theological light motif in pairing the death of his young friend with the death of his mother. Holding together in memory the two experiences of death with their differences, we are led to ask what it is that Augustine has come to understand about suffering and death by the time he writes the Confessions. For leitmotif to work, it must play upon time and memory, much the way that Augustine plays with time and memory in the narrative of the Confessions, and then later ponders the metaphysics of time and memory in the last parts of the work. There's the temporal order of the musical piece itself unfolding within itself. But there's also the temporal consciousness of the listener that transcends the musical time and effectively holds it together as a unity for judgment and understanding like a sentence whose temporal unfolding in speech must be held together as one in memory in order to understand its meaning as a whole. Light motif is constant in the Tree of Life. The most obvious use is in the musical score. There's the use of Respighi's gorgeous Siciliana suite, which occurs twice. 
First, when the mother and father are falling in love early on, ending with the birth of their first child. We've already seen and heard that passage. The suite is played in a resplendent and joyful tone. But that musical theme, and, and in full orchestration, but that musical theme is repeated again in a much more somber, restrained, and variant tone, simply on a piano. When later the father loses his job, returns to his wife to tell her, and then reflects upon how he had lost the sense of wonder at the glory around him. The musical overlay in his sorrow takes us back to the original moments in which the love of mother and father were first born and sets the context for its rebirth in this moment of sorrow. It's important to keep a few things in mind in this particular part of the film. Notice the Augustinian over-narration of Jack. Father, mother, always you wrestle inside me, always you will. Also notice that the father portrays himself on the one hand as a righteous man who never missed a day of work and tithed every Sunday, a man like Job. On the other hand, he portrays himself as a man who lived in shame and dishonored the glory around him. But misericordia is shown him. In the first scene, love is born between man and woman and becomes incarnate in the child Jack. In the second scene, that child, their incarnate love, is present as a witness to the rebirth of their love in misericordia. Another instance of musical leitmotif is Malik's use of two different settings of the Requiem Mass. The first is the extraordinary use of the passage, Lacrimosa Diaz Ila, full of tears shall be that day, from Zbigniew Preisner's Requiem for My Friend, the music that Malik invokes at the moment of creation.
The second time he invokes the Requiem setting, it is Hector Berlioz's Requiem, just as the dinosaurs are going to be destroyed and life recreated on Earth, when the mother says in over-narration, light of my life, I search for you, my hope, my life, my child. With Preisner's Requiem, we see visually the beginning of creation, with the, while the Latin intones, Diaz ila lacrimosa, full of tears shall be that day. Now, with this use of Berlioz's Requiem, visually we see the impending destruction of life on earth that will be followed by its rebirth. The lyrics intoned in this passage are, and let Saint Michael thy standard bearer lead them into the holy light which once thou didst promise to Abraham and his seed, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The third time the Requiem is invoked is a repetition of this very same passage from Berlioz, when the family leaves their home near the end of the film to begin a new life elsewhere. They are setting off like Abraham from Ur to be reborn as he was reborn. The only way to be happy is to love. Unless you love, your life will flash by. In both scenes, we have the portrayal of a new beginning and reference to hope. In the first scene, in over-narration, the mother expresses her hope in her child whom she searches for. The moment she says, my child, my hope, the Requiem is singing, Domine Jesu. The second Berlioz Requiem scene ends with her wandering in the woods in her mourning clothes, trying to remember, and then moves to another scene in mourning clothes where she opens her eyes in a moment of remembrance and recognition. So you see her eyes are open there. Again, when she says, do good to them, wonder, hope, the words of the Requiem are Domine Jesu, as they had been in the earlier scene. Notice also that the scene of them leaving their home for a new life begins in remembrance with the child she is searching for burying a memento, a memory, in the backyard of the old house. Moving forward in hope requires memory of what went before, even to the beginning. Finally, the fourth use of the Requiem theme is again from Berlioz's work, but now it is the last passage of the musical piece in the last stages of the film on the beach in the sunlit plain, when the mother, mother walks out into the sunlight and offers her son. We'll come back to that scene later. In all these instances of musical light motif, the use of Respighi, Preissner, and Berlioz, we are given the theme of an original creation and a new creation, of a creation that begins in tears, moves through hope, and ends in an offering of love. 
but to grasp them requires the play of time and memory. The use of musical light motif in the score helps us to structure the play of time and memory in the film. But from that musical light motif, Malik goes even deeper into the visual nature of the film itself. Consider the flame that comes into play throughout the film. At the very beginning of the film, all the way to the last shot of the film. And this is a little bit long, so I apologize. And a little jerky. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Oops, maybe I have to click it. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, it's not. Darn it. Ah, wasn't patient enough. There we go. Now what do I have to do to start it? No? No. Is there some fraud in the scheme of the universe? Is there nothing which is deathless? Nothing which does not pass away? We cannot stay where we are. We must journey forth. We must find that which is greater than fortune and fate. Nothing can bring us peace but that. Is the body of the wise man or the just exempt from any pain? from any disquietude, from the deformity that might blight its beauty, from the weakness that might destroy its health. 
Do you trust in God? Job, too, was close to the Lord. Are your friends and children your security? There is no hiding place in all the world where trouble may not find you. No one knows when sorrow might visit his house any more than Job did. So those were all in um, chronological order from the beginning of the film to the end of the film to the beginning of the credits. The flame that stands alone is the product of what is called a clavelux, an instrument in, in, invented in the 1920s by Thomas Wilfred to present light as a musical work of art played on a keyboard, playing on the notion of synesthesia whereby the sonic is transformed into the luminous. The use of the clavelux to produce the flame in the film suggests Malick's desire to present a musical piece visually, playing with light and shadow rather than sound and silence. The votive candles that appear throughout the film are images of the original flame that appears again and again throughout the film. The filmmaker's art is the construction of images cast by light. In his Republic, Plato, whom Malick would have known well from his study of philosophy at Harvard, as a young man, cast an image in words of a cave in which people were imprisoned by images cast by a light behind them and shadows before them. The point of that image that Plato cast, the allegory of the cave, was to critique artistic representation, among other things, and reject images as imprisoning one within ignorance. So the poets, the artists, the makers of images are banished from the ideal republic as leading citizens away from the truth toward ignorance. Malick is responding to Plato with the aesthetics of his art. The casting of his images in light and shadow lead one from the image to the reality. Malick's film is sacramental in pointing to a sacred truth beyond itself. The artist performs this creation of images in imitation of God, who in the beginning cast an image of himself in humankind. God made man to his image, male and female, he made them. He blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. The poet, the artist, the one who fashions his images out of created light and shadow, co-creates with God, the uncreated light, in a way completing with God, in a way completing with God his creation, as Pope St. John Paul argued. We get the word votive from the Latin term votum, which means vow. Lighting a votive candle is the fulfillment of a vow, a vow to pray for another, typically someone who has died, but other intentions as well. The fulfillment of the vow by the lighting of the candle is itself an act of memory. One has to recall what one has promised to do for another in order to fulfill it. The votive candle is an image of the sanctuary candle, representing the Holy Spirit and marking the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. When Christ ascended to heaven, he made a vow to his followers. The advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Notice the explicitly Trinitarian character of that passage. The Father will fulfill the promise, the vow of the Son, 
by sending the Holy Spirit to remind them of everything Christ taught. That vow was fulfilled on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon them in tongues of flame. A votive is an act of misericordia in imitation of Christ, which is what the sanctuary lamp makes us remember in calling our attention to Christ present in the tabernacle as in the womb of Mary, mater misericordiae. When we promise to pray for another, we are images of Christ. When we fulfill that promise by lighting a candle, we remember that promise and we ourselves are images of both the Father and the Holy Spirit. Suppose then that we see Malik's film as a votive cast in light and shadow. What is the film an image of? As a work of art, it is a visual requiem. But a requiem is a mass of remembrance in which God offers us his son as we pray for misericordia and rest for those who have died. In the following two clips, this again for light motif, pay particular attention to the faces, particularly the faces of the mother, but also the similarity in the faces of the father and the son, as well as the timing of the words, glory and shame. If you remember the clip in which the father speaks of forgetting the glory, as he speaks of glory, Malak cuts to a shot of it of the father's wife. He then speaks of living in shame as Malak cuts to a shot of his son Jack. Now watch these. How long do you love the canals of rain? A big man. I'm nothing. Now, uh, in the film, what he's saying there is that poor boy, that poor boy. And that's said when um, his uh, younger son dies, the younger son. But against the background of the connection of shame, it could just as well be about his older son, Jack, whom he communicates his own shame to his son. And that causes the alienation uh, and then the death of the spirit in his son. I could multiply many instances of leitmotif in the film, but what is the significance of all this playing with time and memory in the film for thinking about God's response to suffering and evil? Midway through the film, the boy R.L. asks his mother before bed to tell us a story from before we can remember. What follows is the mother relating how after her graduation, she had taken a plane ride, and we see that ride, we see that ride flying over broad fields and forests. Then the film immediately cuts to a scene of starkly contrasting magical realism, where the mother herself floats in air as if flying, or better, dancing underneath the trunk and branches of a tree. For late, for, and for later, keep in, keep in your memory the color of her dress. Tell us a story from before we can remember. Right in the plane once. It's a graduation present. Father. 
This is an extraordinary moment. We, we, we begin with the natural realis realism of the plane ride in which the son Jack says in over narration, Father, make me good, brave. At that point, the play of light and shadow of the film shifts to magical realism with the mother dancing in air under a tree, as if an angel, or better, as if full of grace beneath the tree of life. Father, make me good, brave. Son, behold your mother. The film, in light motif, is using memory to remind us of something, to provide us with a variation on a theme of a story told from before we can remember. Recall that the film begins with a simple frame quoting the book of Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? This is how God responds to Job when he finally asks him, why? His friends had spent many chapters trying to explain to Job how he somehow deserved his suffering or how God was not a good God. Job had responded to them all expressing his faithfulness to God. Similarly, in the film, the mother has to listen to friends and family trying to make sense of the death of her son. Her own mother, the boy's grandmother, counsels stoicism. You've got your memories. This is the way he, God, is. People pass on. Life goes on. He sends flies to wounds he should heal. Ending with the extraordinarily awful cliché, you've still got the other two. To which the grieving mother simply responds with an expression of extraordinary pain and weeping. The priest gives her the cliché, he's in God's hands now. To which she simply and sorrowfully responds, he was always in God's hands, wasn't he? But then walking alone in silence through a grove of trees, mourning in the privacy of her suffering heart, she closes her eyes as if in contemplation and asks Job's question, why? But Malek has her add God's own words as well when she says, where were you? In the silence of her suffering heart, she both asks Job's question and remembers God's response. God went on to retell to Job the making of the world in the beginning, a retelling of Genesis at much greater length. Oops. Malik makes the viewer visually remember that retelling of Genesis with the extraordinary creation sequence, including the creation of the love of man and wife and the birth of their son. Then God made man to his own image, male and female he made them, and he blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply. To be born is to be born to, born to run, born to play, born to love, 
born to God. The story from before we can remember is that we are born to God as his image. What does that mean? The book of Genesis begins appropriately enough with, in the beginning, God created the, gen the heavens and the earth. The beginning of the Gospel of John is a scriptural leitmotif of Genesis, as it also begins with, in the beginning. But it varies the theme. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Through him all things came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. John reminds us that the story from before we can remember has a beginning before the beginning of Genesis, a beginning before the beginning of time, a beginning in the inner life of the Trinity when Jesus was with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Through casting an image in light and shadow, Malik advances this scriptural mo light motif by reminding us that in the beginning were the tears. Lacrimosa, diaz ila, full of tears, shall be that day. The mother continues her prayer of remembrance. Did you know? of the Requiem there, in addition to Lacrimosa, um, are spare him, O God, merciful Jesus, grant them eternal rest. Did God know? We often forget that there are two trees given names in the Garden of Eden. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which we are forbidden to eat. The tree that gets all the media attention, as it were. But there are all the other trees we are allowed to eat of, among which only one is named the tree of life. The day that all the other trees were planted in the garden was also the day that the tree of life was planted. God responds to her, I knew. He responds to her tears with his tears. Lacrimosa, diaz ila. Full of tears shall be that day. On that day when the tree of life was planted, Jesus wept as he wept for Lazarus. Spare him, O God, merciful Lord Jesus. Grant them eternal rest. Did you know? Yes. Aquinas tells us that human misericordia, human mercy, presupposes suffering and responds to it in compassion. It begins in a suffering heart that has seen the suffering of another and moves in friendship toward the one who suffers. There is no mercy from a distance. This is why it is not Greek eleos, or pity. Misericordia then acts to assist the one who suffers to the extent that it can. The merciful act comes out of the suffering heart. Divine mercy, mercy is similar but different. I mentioned above that Aquinas maintains that the act of creation itself is an act of divine mercy. It is the primordial manifestation of God's mercy. By it we come to be, are created as images of God. In a certain respect, this reverses the order of movement of human misericordia. 
where in human mercy, the merciful moves towards the other, here in the mercy of creation, God draws us toward himself. Divine mercy begins with God creating us to be friends, drawn toward him in love, born to love God and neighbor as his images. To be an image of God is to be drawn to God through memory, understanding, and love, which is what Augustine argued in the De Trinitate. There is no cause for weeping there. But then in the incarnation of God, uh, but then in the incarnation, God says, I offer you my son who weeps. Jesus makes us, makes our offer, I'm sorry, Jesus makes our suffering his own. But this manifestation of mercy in the incarnation is not distinct from the, from the mercy of creation. It is rather its fulfillment. God from his primordial merciful act adopts our suffering in friendship for and with us. The merciful act of creation precedes the suffering of Christ's sacred human heart, but is fulfilled in the merciful act made known to Mary, mother of mercy, at the tree of life, the tree of life first planted in the garden. In the story of Lazarus, Jesus refers to Lazarus as our friend. He weeps for his friend like Augustine wept for his young friend, but also unlike Augustine. It is rather the way that Augustine learned to weep for those who die in Adam, as Augustine wept for his mother Monica. Commenting on Jesus weeping at the grave, Aquinas argues that Christ teaches against the Stoics that weeping for a dead friend is indeed rational and the expression of a virtue. Thus, the grandmother's Stoic response is not an image of God's response to evil and suffering. Those who weep for their friends in the right way are living to the image of God. Aquinas points out that it is through Christ's divinity that he mercifully raises Lazarus from the dead, but only after he has, through his humanity, in his suffering heart, mercifully wept for his friends. In focusing on Misericordia and Lacrima Christi, the tears of Christ, we are not offered a solution to the problem of evil, as if a philosophical problem in which we hypothesize about God's mind and intentions, looking for what strike us as possible and plausible reasons for allowing evil. When philosophers do that, I worry that they are simply exculpating God in the face of evil and suffering as if defending God in the dock, so to speak. An exculpation that makes suffering banal and almost trivial, since we now have a deus ex machina solution to the problem, and can by, by and large go on with our lives. Perhaps as philosophers we need to live like Mary in the presence of the tree of life. God does not tell us in this life what his thoughts and intentions were, and are in allowing evil and suffering amidst the glory and wonder of his creation. What God does is show his response to that evil and suffering that he allows. He shows us the glory and wonder of misericordia, born of Mary's womb, to which we are called as images. Pay attention now in the clip that's coming up. Pay attention to the dress, I mentioned that before, the hands, I mentioned that before, and the sunflowers. As images of God, born to God, we are to respond to evil and suffering as God did and does. We are to be faithful to him and to all those who suffer, uh, whom we encounter on our way to God. When we are not merciful, when we do not show the face of misericordia to all those whom we meet along the road, we extinguish the votive candle of our lives.
the music there is the last instance of Berlioz's Requiem, the last passage in which it, which it is prayed, grant unto them eternal rest, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Amen. Sunflowers are not called sunflowers because they are heliotropes, that is, plants that follow the sun. There are lots of heliotropes, but these are called sunflowers. They're not called sunflowers because they are heliotropes. They're called sunflowers because they are images of the sun. Just consider how many levels of meaning are to be found in that scene. She offers her son. She is the mother of RL and the son, or sorry, she is the mother and the son is RL. She offers him back to God who had given him to her. But her hands there, when she is like that, her hands there are a light motif of her hands when she held the foot of her child Jack when he was born, but from the other side. His foot is on the inside, now you see the outsides. When he was born. So she offers her son Jack, who started out spiritually dead, but who ends full of the new life of grace by remembering how she bore her suffering. She is Monica, offering Augustine. But most richly, she's an image of God, offering us her son. In this, she is no longer a visual representation, but breaks the sonic frame and becomes an oral icon of Mary, the perfect image, of the perfect human image of God. She says to us, the viewer, I offer you my son. Misericordia is the bridgehead to that small good. Thank you. So at 4.30, if anybody wants to go, that's fine. I'm also willing to stay a little bit longer since it's the last session of the day before drinks. <laughs> so if anybody would, or mass, well. <laughs> man does not live by bread alone. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Yes. Oh boy, that's really good. Um, so the question was, um, with Augustine you have the theme of the restless heart. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Um, and how that might be present in uh, the film. I think um, it is, it, it's seen in the, in the way in which they are in fact, and in fact there's a passage, which I think it was one in, in one of the clips, um, where Jack, the son, um, expresses his sense of loss and the need to um, find, right? And I think that expresses it for one, that is f trying to find what he had lost or forgotten. And I think just the, the um, dramatic elements of tension and um, the love of one another, but nonetheless the longing for something else, um, I think that, I, I, honestly, I think that, you know, the Restless Heart passage, I think is from the book, first book, and um, I think that, and it runs throughout the confessions until he comes to that self-understanding. And I'd say, I couldn't point to anything specific because I think the whole thing is about that. It's about the restless heart. And where does the heart rest? St. Augustine says he rested in his tears because God was the one listening. So if I were to put another line of conclusion here, you've got to be careful, but um, uh, the heart rests in misericordia. Thomas says, misericordia is the great, considered in itself, is the greatest of all virtues, even considered in itself, greater than caritas, because he says it's the most godlike. Misericordia is the most godlike. And so we are most like God. Now, there's a theological point to be made about caritas there. But we rest in misericordia, we rest in God. Susie Volstein. Thank you so much.
much. I, the first time I saw this movie, I felt a certain resistance, which you have certainly felt, but I still feel it's, it's one side. So I, I've lost two sons, died in my life. Um, I certainly felt sorrow, but mercy is God's fullness filling our empty. Yeah, well, first, of course, I'm sorry for the loss of your two children. Um, I mean, there's a lot there, Susie. Um, first, one thing I'd say is vis-a-vis um, -vis Ostia, yes, there's the beautiful scene, and yet, after she dies, Augustine weeps, and he prays for her, despite that anticipation, right, since it's not, it's not, it can't be um, presumptuous, right, they're, they're hopeful and so on. Um, but then also, I think, I wouldn't say it's so dark. I, I wouldn't say it's so dark in two ways. One, um, one of the things it portrays is that we're not, we are in this world, but not of this world. To be in this world is very difficult at times, and at other times not. So when they're leaving the house, right, as Abraham, Ur of the Chaldees, and so on, when they're leaving the house, she's hopeful, filled with joy, the only way to be happy in this life is to love. Unless you love, your life will flash by. So there's the, you know, she has come to something. She understands something. But then again, there's the play of time and memory here because um, that's early in um, the lives of the children. But it's late in the film. Okay, so he's playing with the memory. Early in the film is the death of her son. Long after they moved out of the home. To or the Cal or from or the Chaldees, right? So there's this kind of play there. Um, the joy and the hope that she experienced when she was reconciled to her husband by his loss and the way they handled it, um, it goes on, and it's not done because other things happen. Other things happen in life: the loss of another loved one, um, the physical loss of a loved one. But then at the same time, he says in a kind of, again, a magical realism moment where he sees them mourning in the past and he's standing in the background and she's by the window, he says, how did you bear it? And that's a key for him to return to the life of grace in this life. One of the odd things, if those of you have seen it, is people were kind of blown away in good and bad ways by the last scene, which is on the beach. And a lot of people thought that was really cheesy because they thought that was like heaven. It's the life of grace. And so when he goes through that door, he's returned to the life of grace in this life because it shows him after the beach and after this, it shows him back at work. But through his memory, he is now in the life of grace where before he wasn't. So um, I guess my point would be that, yes, God gives us this project. What is that project? Misericordia. We show the face of God. 
when we show the face of mercy to those around us. That's when we are images of God. And so that's the task, to be to the image and likeness of God in this life by showing the face of mercy, which is what she shows to her sons. And that's why they, and, and to her husband, and pretty much to everybody around her, and that's why she's an icon of Mary. I, the point I made about the sonic icon, though, I've been emphasizing throughout that visually he's doing a requiem, right? He's synesthesia. It's visually a requiem. But then right there at the end, he reverses it because he's been doing a visual thing all throughout, a visual musical, right? When she says, I, and she's visually the symbol of Mary, but an icon addresses the viewer. She doesn't look out at the viewer in the visuals, but orally she speaks to the listener of the film. And so now he's suddenly shifted back into the sonic. And she's a, we're used to visual icons, but she's a sonic icon. They're breaking the frame of the film and addressing directly those who listen. I offer you my son. Oh, sure. And then the joke of you thinking like you're retelling creation, and he's doing the death of his brother, he's asking for wine, and he might have been wondering if he's also doing the creation of the death of his brother. Well, there's an explicit Cain and Abel moment in the film when um, he's been kind of teasing his brother, you know, kind of um, uh, acting as if he's going to hurt his brother. He takes a, a lamp and he says, Put your finger in there, right? And, and the brother kind of holds off and then. Finally, he puts his finger in there, and he doesn't get shocked. But his brother says, <laughs> and he jumps back, as if he had been shocked, but then he realizes he hadn't been shocked. A classic brother's kind of torture of one another. Um, and, and, he be, and he's envious of his brother, because his brother is a musical genius. There's another scene where um, his brother plays the classical guitar by ear. And his father, who's a wonderful pianist, is playing a piano piece. And the brother is just sort of sitting on the porch listening to his father. And you can just see this happen. He listens to the tune, and then he starts to play along on the guitar. And the father hears that. And there's this transition in the father with regard to the younger son. Where the, with regard to the younger son, hearing his son play and recognizing his son is a greater musician, he then transitions to accompanying his son. Well, the wonderful thing about that scene is Jack is in the background walking around watching all of this. So you have the growth of envy. And then that thing about the shocking of the finger, well, he set him up because he's out in the woods with a BB gun and he um, set, says, put your finger over it. Because right? he set up this idea of, I don't actually ever hurt you. Right? And then he pulls the trigger and the BB comes out and hits his brother's finger. And his brother runs off screaming in pain. But then I didn't show it because I too long anyway. So there's your Cain and Abel moment, right? There's more Genesis. Okay. Um, but then um, uh, later there's a scene of reconciliation, which actually in Jack's childhood, because again, you get this life goes up and down. In Jack's childhood, he recovers grace because his brother forgives him explicitly. There's a wonderful scene. And then Jack starts to be merciful to everybody around him. But then something happens because he's at work and he's lost that. Right? Uh, so there's that. And then also just um, this takes no, and that's why I didn't emphasize it other than just the Garden of Eden, but this takes no great um, understanding to uh, point out. You could just go through there and the number of times trees show up. And they're under a tree. They're, or the, you're looking down through the tree. They plant a tree in remnants of uh, their grandfather who died with the hands. Jack does and his dad you know, the, uh, and so on. So, so um, the tree is constant um, throughout there.
the tree that's in the plant or outside the big steel and concrete skyscrapers, but there's that tree in the midst of all the ugliness is that tree. Did you say what you mean? Uh, you know, uh, the, the Hebrew uh, covenant fidelity is, is sort of an end for this. And I'm wondering what you think the particular nuance that he's trying to convey in Misericordia is, itself is, as opposed to all the other forms that uh, I heard you, you mention. Well, so uh, actually the notion of faithfulness, um, uh, this again is a part that I cut. Um, in terms of the leitmotif theme, uh, that last scene is in leitmotif of one of the first scenes. If you've seen the film, she talks about the way of nature and the way, or the way of grace and the way of nature. The nuns taught us, and she says, and they taught us uh, those who remain faithful to the way of grace, nothing will, bad will ever happen to them, and so on and so on. The moment she says that, that nothing, uh, no, nothing bad, or not. No evil will ever come to those who remain faithful to the way of grace. And then immediately it shifts to a scene of a man walking up to her to the door, a postman with a telegram. And that's when she finds out that her son died. And when she was saying that no evil shall come, it, the camera is on the son, this son who was kind and wonderful and true. Right? Um, and so she said just before that, just before she says, no evil will come, she says, um, I will remain true to you no matter what comes. And that's when it shifts to the scene of the postman coming up. So then the question becomes, with all those scenes, will she keep her vow? Will she keep her vow? The last scene is her keeping of the vow. She has remained true. She has remained true in a way that brings her son um, back to the faith, her husband. Um, but she has been faithful throughout, despite the trials. Um, but then, again, that's at the literal level, to use some Augustinian things here, right? Um, you might say at the spiritual level, she's speaking for God when she says in the beginning, I will remain true to you no matter what comes. That's the divine covenant. Well, what is the vow? The vow, I will be remain true to the creation in which my mercy was expressed. So mercy, right, misericordia, is at the heart of being. And God will remain true to that throughout. They have to remember. So she's speaking both for herself on the literal plane and, and expressing God's vow of faithfulness spiritual yeah I got that question before when I gave a similar talk not just this one yeah he doesn't speak okay. <laughs> now there's an explanation there well I shouldn't say there's an explanation of that because I've never met the man um, um, he's a certain sort of philosopher. He studied with certain sorts of philosophers at Harvard, in particular Stanley Cavell. Um, very a much a kind of anti-solipsistic philosopher. Um, the, so I think Malik would say, if someone said to him, um, well, what do you mean by that? Right? As if you could get behind it. Right? And you're asking him to say what he meant. Well, the problem with solipsism is, and he's a good philosopher, then you have to say, well, what do you mean by what you just said? Right? You can't get behind the manifestation of a thought to get at the thought apart from the manifestation. So I think he would say, and this is what I would say, I'm paying attention to what he said. Um, if he were to disagree, he could make that clear. Or maybe, I mean, he could say so, right? But I think his answer to that question, what did you really mean, he'd say, Watch the movie. 
and think about it? How do we know what God really means? Watch the story. The philosophers want to solve the problem of evil. What is solving the problem of evil? Getting outside what God has revealed and trying to get to what's in God's mind apart from what God has revealed. God does not tell us the reason I allow for evil is so that you can have free will. He didn't say that at all. Nowhere as far as I know. What does he say? He says, I offer you my son. But we don't listen to that because we want to get at his mind apart from what he himself is telling us. So I think he would say, pay, Malik, pay attention to what I've said. And don't worry about what you think, I think, behind what I've said. The richness of the saying is there. I mean, Augustine on scripture, right? Any particular passage, Augustine's kind of liberal on interpretation. Four principles of interpretation. Doesn't contradict anything else in scripture. Doesn't contradict the rule of faith. Oh, I'm forgetting them now. Um, uh, builds, up builds up charity, and then there's the fourth one. Um, oh, and uh, will be repeated in some literal sense elsewhere, and so on. Um, but then he says, after that, you know, in terms of interpretation, go at it. Because he says, God intended you to understand that meaning that observes those four conditions, their negative conditions. After that, be confident that God knew that that's the way you would read it. And so you're fine if the and I think, I don't know, I think Malik would be roughly the same one. He's not God, but <laughs> he put a lot of depth into that. You know, you just go further and further down. He's actually, I believe, I mean, it's hard to find these things out because he is kind of a recluse. I believe he's an Assyrian Catholic, or was. Uh, his uh, parents, or at least his father, came from um, Baghdad, I think. Um, um, and he would have been, they were, Assyrian Catholics were Nestorians up until fairly recently, which might be a thousand years ago. Um, but so he would have been an Assyrian Catholic. I believe he's now an Episcopalian. Yeah, um, maybe something. Have you ever done a like this on your film, No, no. Um, I, have the ex I have the experience of this film that I had uh, watching the Notre Dame-Miami game in 1987. Single greatest football game I've ever seen, and still to this day. And after I saw it, I thought, never want to see another football game, because nothing will be like this. And that's sort of the way I feel about this film. I'm like, and it's not a fear of being disappointed or anything like that. I'm just like, this is enough for me, you know, to, to spend my, uh, at least the life that's given to me to thinking about it. Thank you.